called the vice chancellor here, invited the Nobel laureate to come to the university and address the faculty and students. The Nobel laureate was wondering what he should speak on. Finally, he decided to pick up each one of the letters which constituted the name of the university, weave around the theme and speak. So, so he spoke on Y for you, A for ambition, L for liberty, and E for energy, and spoke for more than an hour. At the end of the lecture, one of his professors went up to him and said, I'm happy you did not go to the Massachusetts Institute. <laughs> <laughs> the email correspondent that I had with the office bearers of the Rotary Club, I was told that I can speak for about 20, 25 minutes. There lies the problem. <laughs> Generally, it takes 30 minutes for a professor to warm up in the classroom <laughs> and to expect him to speak for 20 or 25 minutes is an inhuman task. However, I shall try to be as brief as possible. The Hollywood actress Elizabeth Taylor told her husband soon after her ninth marriage, this too shall be brief. <laughs> Monumental book, Professor Arnold Toynbee, considered to be the greatest historian of the 20th century. He analyzes the growth and development of various civilizations which originated in the world, how they originated, how they developed, how they flowered, how they decayed, and how they disappeared from history. He discusses about 22 civilizations which originated and disappeared. And in the, among these 22 civilizations, only two civilizations have cultural continuity from the past to the present. And of course, the time we refers to them as the Indic civilization, namely the Indian civilization, and the second one, Cynic civilization, the Chinese civilization. Only these two a historical and cultural continuity. And these two civilizations confronted each other in Southeast Asia, which lies to the south of China and east of India. The first encounter was in the early centuries of the Christian era, when the Indian cultural influences went to Southeast Asia, and the Chinese were trying to spread their influence in northern part of Vietnam. In that encounter, it was India which succeeded, and you can see remnants of Indian cultural forms in almost all these countries, Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, southern part of Vietnam, Laos, and now. The modern confrontation which is taking place in the 20th century, because Bal Subramanian was telling me that if you want to make a comparative study of the overseas Chinese, and the overseas Indians, the best place is Southeast Asia. In his book, Southeast Asia Between Two Worlds, a fascinating book, one of the first books that I read when I started specializing in Southeast Asia, Tiber Mende, he quotes Arnold Toynbee and mentions that in this confrontation between China and India and Southeast Asia, China will win. It will move east, it will move westward at the cost of India. And the countries which lie between India and South East, India and China will go asunder under China. The prophetic words, will those prophetic words come true? Will China overwhelm these countries? Or will these small countries, dynamic as they are, resilient as they are, will they have sufficient resilience to withstand the Chinese pressure and continue to be dynamic nation states? This is going to be the answer in the present century. When great civilizations like India and China wake up, there will naturally be tremors and apprehensions around the world. Unfortunately, the Indian perception of China, like that of the rest of the world, had been molded and shaped by Western scholarship. And this Western scholarship has done incalculable harm for us. Years ago, when I was studying in Bombay University, I had to study a paper called History of the Far East where we were taught about the history of China, Japan, 
and Korea. How did China become Far East for us? The northern neighbor, northeastern neighbor. The term Far East was used by the European countries because Europe was the intellectual center of the world and for them China was Far East. Even Australia uses China, which is for northern part as Far East. It's only now that we use the term East Asia. And during, during the Vasco da Gama epoch of history, as we call it, 1498 to 1949, with the arrival of Vasco da Gama in Calicut to the revolution in China in 1949, it was a European scholarship. They set in motion ideas and concepts which we blindly, uh, which we blindly borrowed. The Chinese, unlike many new, the newly developed countries like Australia or Canada or Singapore, they do not consider the past to be a burden. They consider the past to be a heritage, a noble heritage, which will be cherished and preserved. And what is happening is that the outside contact with China had was one in which the outside contribution was cynicized. <coughs> Buddhism went from India to China, but the Chinese sinicized Buddhism. And when Buddhism spread from China to Japan, and to Korea, and to Vietnam, the Vietnamese Vietnamized it, just as the Chinese did that. As you all know, Marxism and Leninism, which Mao adopted as a model for the revolution, in the process they sinicized Marxism and Leninism. The classical theory of Marxism and Leninism, the revolution will have to be led by the industrial proletariat. But in China, the revolution was led by the agricultural present. So, uh, this concept of sinicizing the various ideas and concepts is extremely important. The second thing is that unlike England, unlike France, unlike the United States, China is not a political term. China is a civilizational term. By civilizational term, I mean those who followed the essentials of Chinese civilization, they live in China. The Chinese civilization started in the Yellow River Valley. Gradually, that civilization spread. That is, those people who were living outside the Yellow River Valley, whom the Chinese called as barbarians, they were sinicized. When China extended, Chinese civilization extended, and these people were sinicized. So it's a cultural term, and not a political term as such. And this cultural continuity that we speak of is because the basic elements of the Chinese civilization has continued from the ancient times to the modern times. In fact, the Chinese we used to consider the outsiders the barbarians. In fact, the character with the Chinese use for a foreigner is one of barbarian, till the Opium Wars. The Opium Wars, China was defeated, Opium was thrust on them, China was humiliated and all those things. In fact, in mid-1960s, Andre Marlow, the well-known French political philosopher, he went to China and interviewed Mao Zedong. The text of the interview appeared in the American magazine New Republic, and it was compulsory reading for us. In the course of the interview, Andre Marlow asked Mao Zedong, what is the impact of French Revolution on China? French Revolution, which took place in 1789. Mao paused for a couple of minutes, and then he said, it is too early to tell. <laughs> there was another interesting story which was attributed to the interview between Andra Marlow and Mao Zedong, but it does not appear in the text. I recall the New Statesman, which was probably edited by Kingsley Martin at that time, carried that story. Where Andra Marlow asked Mao Zedong, if instead of Kennedy, just Khrushchev who was assassinated, what would have been his impact on international relations? Mao pondered for a couple of minutes and then he said, I'm sure Onassis would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned to you in Southeast Asia, which rise from Myanmar to Philippines, <coughs> southern part of China, and eastern part of India, these two civilizations confronted each other. The initial encounter in the first century of the Christian era, it was India which won. 
the classroom situation, I always say, wherever the people eat with their hands, you can see Indian influence. Where they use the chopsticks, you can see the Chinese civilization. The Vietnam was sinicized. That means for a period of 900 years in the northern part of Vietnam, was under the control of the Chinese. Control of the Chinese means they imposed the Chinese culture in the northern part of Vietnam. But the Vietnamese were great nationalists. At every opportunity that they had, they resisted the Chinese rule. They overthrew them. In fact, in the Vietnamese history, there are two women whose birthday is considered to be a holiday in Vietnam. They are the Trung sisters. And these two women mobilized the Vietnamese population against the Chinese, threw away the Chinese yoke, but the Chinese sent back their army and fearing humiliation and threat to their chastity, these Trung sisters committed suicide. And uh, nationalism, Vietnamese nationalism, just like Ch Chinese nationalism, is an important feature of this. What are the salient features of the Chinese culture? Uh, I'll briefly explain some of them. The first is the theory of kingship, which is called mandate from heaven. That is, the ruler has got a mandate from heaven to rule the people. He has to be a virtuous ruler. The mandate is to be a virtuous ruler to rule the people according to the tenets of the Confucian ethics. If he turns a tyrant, the people have got the right to rebel against him and throw him out. But if he turns a tyrant, the mandate from heaven is removed. So Chinese history is full of instances where people revolt against the ruler and change him. It's unlike the Devaraja cult in India, where the king, at the time of coronation, performs rituals and he becomes the god king. The king becomes god on earth, and therefore the people have no right to rebel against him. Etc. The mandate from heaven is very different from that. That's the Devaraja cult becomes immensely popular in the Southeast Asian countries, but not the mandate from heaven. The second one is the institutional mandarinate. The institutional mandarinate are the institutional civil service. From very early times, the Chinese used to hold competitive examination throughout the empire to select the civil servants. And those who qualified in this examination, they became the civil servants, they became the learned people, the mandarins, and to these mandarins who provided administrative continuity. Unlike in India, where generally people from the Brahmin community or the forward community became civil servants, the mandarins do not belong to a particular caste. Their qualification is one of mastering the classics and passing the examination. The third one is the Chinese script and language, which has given continuity. The Chinese, as some of you at least may know, does not have a script as we know A, B, C, D, R, R. They don't have it. The Chinese have characters, and each character conveys an idea. Now suppose you want to convey the idea of brightness. They draw a character which shows the sun and the moon. If they want to show the show happiness, they show a father and mother in a house, two children play. The idea of happiness is conveyed through the character. Now this character, how do you pronounce this character? The, pronoun the pronouncement or the speaking part of it varied from one part of China to another part, unintelligible. So you have the dialects. So Hokkien is very different from Hakka, Hakka is very different from Cantonese. But the characters remain the same, and this has given historical and cultural, the same script continued until very recently, where they have modernized the script, and they are also introducing Mandarin as the language, as the spoken language throughout China. The, the dialects are all disappearing, and it was very difficult for people to change over. In Singapore, they have introduced Mandarin, but most of the people in Singapore speak Hokkien. So what they do, they switch on the Malaysian TV where there is a Hokkien program. And Lee Kuan Yew in his memoirs mentions the introduction of Mandarin as the common spoken language in Singapore was found it very, very difficult. So Chinese script and language are the one. Then the Confucian values. 
Confucius, his original name was Kang Fu Se, a contemporary of Buddha and Mahavira in the 6th century BC. The British got confused with his name and called him Confucius. I'm not joking, this is the real, real truth behind it. The Confucian ethics is one in which human behavior is explained. Virtue should be the guide. What should be the relation between father and children? What should be the relation between families? What should be the relation between families and the village? Village and the king, etc. These Confucian values are explained. It is not uh, it is not a case of uh, uh, you know God and all those things. That's not only with the righteous conduct as such. Now this astonishing historical and cultural continuity of China and people following the same religion. In China, incidentally, we go to the temple and recite prayers. In China, they go to a temple and write prayers. They write the prayer and leave it in the so the astonishing historical and cultural continuity is because of the essentials of Chinese civilization, the institution of uh, mandate from heaven, which continued till 1911 when the emperor lived, uh, the institution of mandarinate, the civil service, Chinese script and language, and the Confucian values. And since people followed the same culture, China does not have the problems of nation building as we have. 91.5% of the people in China are Han people. It's only 8.5% of the people who belong to other ethnic groups like Zhuang, Manchu, Hui, Miao, Uyghur, Tujra, Mongol, Tibetan and others. And this relative cultural homogeneity has made China easy to govern rather than others. And you can see this contrast between India and China. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew in his memoirs mentions, in China 90% are Han Chinese and speak Mandarin. And they have simplified the Chinese characters and educated everyone to speak, everyone to master Chinese. So CCTV is understood throughout the country. Compare the Indian and the Chinese cultures, the Chinese are doers. The Indians are contemplative and argumentative. <laughs> Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has entitled one of his books, The Argumentative Indian. When the Chinese decided to make Chongqing a prosperous center in the western region, they gave the necessary resources. Then you find Chongqing quickly blossoms. A.P. Vengadeshwaran, the former Indian diplomat, also has highlighted how the differing cultural traits have affected the behavior of the Indians and the Chinese. To quote Vengadeshwaran, China is expansionist, India is pacifist, Chinese are taciturn, Indians are garrulous, China is cohesive, India is disparate, Chinese are chauvinist, Indians are liberals, China is assertive, India is open, Chinese are collective minded, collective minded, Indians are highly individualistic, Chinese are calculating, Indians are open minded, Chinese have a superiority complex, Indians, if I may say so, Tamils in Southeast Asia have an inferiority complex. China has been united because the distinguishing characteristics of Chinese civilization, we have many languages, many scripts. We believe in unity and diversity. China is in predominantly inhabited by the Han people. We have many ethnic groups in India, and Chinese are factional. We are physicals. Now, how does this Chinese civilization affect their modern uh, foreign policy as such? Exactly. The first is what is called the Middle Kingdom approach. The Middle Kingdom approach means that China is the center of the universe. It's the Middle Kingdom, all under heaven. And outside, we are nothing to learn. Outside world is one which consists of barbarian. As I told you, till the opium wars, the character of the foreigner was the barbarian. And, such. So, and the, the relation between the Chinese emperor and those who accept the Chinese suzerainty was one of dominance dependency syndrome. The dependent has to koto before the Chinese emperor. The word koto 